Good morning, family. It's great to see everyone here. If you will, please join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us, Lord, and we thank you for the blessings of the people that you surround us with, your children, your believers. And Lord, we just ask that as we look into your word today, that you help us, that we hear what it is that needs to be heard so that we can become better people, better followers of you, Lord, that we may be watchful. And Lord, I just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are going to be finishing up what we started last week in the book of Jude. Now, I did get a couple of comments, and I, I do understand, and I do want to acknowledge that last week was a little heavy on the, on the knowledge and what was being told to us. We looked at the first 11 verses of Jude, and we read that Jude felt the need not just to write about our salvation. He actually said that what happened was he went to write about salvation, but instead he was called upon to write that God commanded his beloved church to do the necessary work of defending the faith. Contending for the faith is also another way that it's put in different translation, but defending the faith in a world of unbelief. Now, this faith is not something that we generate within us. This faith is not something that we can just learn. This faith comes from reading the Bible. This faith is our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's not something man-made or man-generated. So when Jude said that we are to treat our faith as precious and we should defend it, especially from this world, because this world is always trying to erode our faith. It's trying to shake our faith. Jude said that we are to treat our faith as something that needs to be protected. And the only way to do that is to be aware that there is, unfortunately, those among us, and he gave imagery to, to support what he was trying to get across, that there are those who have already snuck in, so to speak, into the churches who have already attempted to, if not already have, eroded or shaken others' faith. They've changed the way that people view faith. Now, this could be anything from a pastor who has changed the way he preaches to better suit the world, to make it more palatable for people to hear because nobody wants to hear that they're sinners. Nobody wants to hear that they need to find God in order to be saved. Instead, they want to hear things like, God loves you, so do what you want. And it's those kind of pastors who are dangerous because the word that they're preaching is not the word of God. But we also see that the threat also comes from the people sitting next to you in the chair who are sitting right in front of the pastor sometimes. They are the ones that sit there, they nod their head, they agree with everything that's said, or seemingly agree with everything that's being said, but they plant seeds of doubt in other believers. They make offhanded comments, they say things to try and make people question whether or not what they're hearing from the Word of God is actually what's right for them. And that's another problem that we have today, is that people, and I believe Angela actually had this up, people do what is right in their own minds and in their own eyes instead of what is right in the Lord's eyes. That is a problem because nowadays, and I say nowadays, but I'm only talking about what I can preach about and what I know, which is what is right now, but we also know that this is not a new problem. This is not something that just happened. So we ended on verse 11 when Jude proclaimed, Woe unto them! And he went on to describe who them or they were. And the people have three qualities that he equated to men in the Bible. So these people who sit there that nod their head, they say they agree with the pastor, yet they don't agree with the pastor on some things. He said that these three people or these people have the qualities of three biblical per persons. He said they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perish in Korah's rebellion. In all three instances, we know that those people that were listed 
actually went against the will of God for their lives. They chose to rebel against what God had ordained. Today we'll be continuing our journey with Jude when he continues his very short epistle. Now, I wish that we had been able to do it all at one time, and I do recommend that if you get a chance, read it all at once. It's always better if it's not disjointed. But we will be continuing, and we'll be reading verses 12 through 25, where we'll get the complete picture of what Jude started. If you will, please turn with me, if you haven't already, to Jude, where we'll be starting at verse 12. Jude verse 12, again, he's speaking of these people that have already come into our churches. They're already infiltrated our churches. He says, these are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, these whose fruit withered. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, whom is reserved, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which, have, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaks great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which are spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last day time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual having, not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, unto eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory, with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. That was a mouthful. So when we look through these verses, verse 12 and 13, Jude continues with what we started last week, with his illustration of the people who have snuck in without us being aware. He describes them as men or hidden reefs at your love feast. That, now, love was used in different translation. Um, charity and love throughout the Bible seems to be something that people believe is interchangeable. Sometimes when charity means love. So at your charity feast or your love feast, as they feast with you, they do without fear. These are like the shepherds of Israel who used to feed themselves and not the flock. They're very impious and impudent people. They're open with their sins. They openly admit that they sin, but they embrace this with the attitude, Jesus died for these sins, so it's okay. 
Now, Jude says they are being blown whatever direction the wind is heading, meaning whatever society is saying is right, whatever society tells us is the it thing to do, that is what they're doing. They're being blown from here to there. Jude calls them trees whose fruit have withered, and they no longer bear fruit. They've been plucked up by their roots, being twice dead. Now, twice dead, that's an that's a illustration because if we are not saved, if we do not accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we do die twice. We die of this body, and then we suffer eternal death in hell. So when he says their roots being twice dead, he means that they have not been saved. Now we've heard people described in this way before. If we look at Matthew 7, 19 and 21, or 19 through 21, it says every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Didn't we just sing today? We will know they were Christians by their love. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jude compares false believers, these people that sit in the pews, these false teachers, the men who preach not God's word but their own. He describes them as wild waves of the sea that carry froth to the shore, bringing their own shame. Now his words echo Isaiah in the description of the wicked. When Isaiah in, in verse 20 says, But the wicked are like a troubled sea when it, comes to, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. So again, we see that those who are not believers, those who are false believers, are also likened unto the wicked, being that their waters are constantly bringing up their faults. Jude tells us that they are wandering stars. They have no direction. And for the people that are those wandering stars, blackness and darkness are reserved for them forever. That, again, is a direct image of hell. In Genesis 5, 22 and 24, we're going to be reading in a moment. Now, I want to make clear that this, is, this verse here, verse 14, Jude does something that very often confuses people. Um, he quotes a man by the name of Enoch. Now, He's not quoting biblical scripture when he quotes Enoch. I want to make that clear. There is no book of Enoch. He's not quoting the Bible. What he is, is he's, quote, he's quoting Jewish tradition from mankind's earliest patriarchs. Because what we know about Enoch, for those who are not familiar with him, is Enoch lived before Noah's flood. Okay? So in Genesis 5, 22 through 24, it says... After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. So Enoch knew God. Enoch followed the Lord. We know this because we were just told that, and it came from the Bible. When Jude recounts the statements made by Enoch concerning the fate of the ungodly. He says, Enoch predicted that the Lord would return to earth with a multitude of holy ones. This, this seems to refer to angels as well as Christians, raptured Christians. We see this imagery in other books as well. In Matthew 25, 31, it says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And then if we look in Colossians 3, 4, it says, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So that's where you could see that if Enoch is saying that 
I believe it was 10,000. He's referring to both angels and to raptured Christians. But the closest verse, if you were to look for a verse, the closest verse biblically that can be referenced would be in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. Now again, this is imagery that could be closely related to what Jude was saying. 7 says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So again, Jude returns to the description of the character after he gives this. What we're looking at is we're looking at the fact that he quoted Enoch and saying, there will be judgment for those who do wrong within the Lord's family. But he also said that it was when Jesus returns with his angels. So Jude returns to a description of these people's character. He wants to really, I guess, get to the point where we're like, okay, we get it, Jude. These people are bad. So what he does is he gives more description of the character. And he says, this is what ungodliness looks like. These men are grumblers, fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves. And they flatter others for their own advantage. So these people will give you comments. They'll give you praise only because they want something in return. Because they know that if they get in good with you, there's something advantageous to them. So Jude has clearly laid out what type of people we are to be careful of. And he gives us examples of how they will act. Now that's a good thing to know. Because that's how we could be discerning on who we listen to. That's how we could be discerning about what kind of music we listen to. There's a lot of worship music out there that sounds biblical. But it's not. There are some unbiblical things about it. But to those who are not discerning, they just hear it and go, oh, I'm praising the Lord. But they're not. The same thing goes when you listen to these prosperity preachers, these TV preachers, and they go on and on and on. And they sound like they're saying things that are out of the Bible. And they might have one or two little tidbits. But for the most part, their message is, give me money. They're doing it for their own benefit. So we know we can look back on what Jude has been telling us so far and we can use these things as examples to be like, all right, I'm going to watch out for that. And if I see something that's close to that, I'm going to avoid confrontation. But the thing is, is Jude's not done. He doesn't give us just the bad. The good part, and like I told everybody last week that... that ask me about it. The good part is, is that now this week we get to hear the good news from Jude. We heard the bad news last week. Now we get to hear the good news. Because up until this point, he's given us nothing but what to look out for because it's bad. So now the good news. He starts on building where he already had made his point that this is not a new problem. We should not be surprised that we have to contend for our faith. It should not come as a shock that we have to fight for the fundamental faith that we have. We see that this faith is being attacked, in society anyways, regularly. Any time that there is something that is done in society, especially if it's against God, people seem to shout it louder, and they want to play the victim. They want to make it sound like, oh, those Christians are persecuting us because we have different faithful beliefs. No, you have no beliefs except for what benefits you. That is your belief system, is what is beneficial to you. That is not a belief system that I will ever ascribe to. The benefits that they seek are temporary. They're just worldly things. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in what God can give us. Then he says... 
Dear friends, remember that the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. Now he's saying, the apostles have told us. If you read the scripture, the apostles tell us very clearly. They said to you, the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. So we've been warned. He's saying, the apostles are clear. We've been warned that there will be men, there will be women, there will be people who will use any tactic to make you believe that they're godly, but in reality, they're serving their own nature. He again reminds his readers that we are dealing with these men who divide you. That is one of the worst things that I can see, is there's going to be times, probably already have, where you've been faithful, you've attended a church, the pastor leaves and a new pastor comes in, and all of a sudden, half the congregation's gone. They've been divided. Why have they been divided? Because they weren't there to hear the word of God. They were there to hear that last pastor. And it depends on what that pastor was like, whether or not he was a biblical preacher or whether or not he was one of those preachers that were preaching his word, not God's. Jude gives us three instructions on what we should be doing for ourselves. Now, this is important because we have to make sure and throughout Scripture, it indicates that we must be on a level where we can help others. It does no good to try and help somebody out of the hole if you're in the hole with them. So, we are to do these things to help ourselves so that we are able to help others. So, the first thing he says is we need to build ourselves up. I also would like to say that in building ourselves up, we are able to build up those around us. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are able to be built up right there with us. So I would say, instead of just building ourselves up, we build each other up in the most holy faith. Now again, the most holy faith is not something we invent. This comes straight from the Bible. It comes from God. It was the faith once delivered to the holy people. It's faith that comes from the apostles and Jesus Christ. Now, the second thing he says that we have to do, and this is a hard one for some, even though it seems like it should be very simple. The second thing we need to do is we must pray in the Holy Spirit. This is talk about praying under the leadership empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Now, some people want to say Holy Ghost. I'm partial to Holy Ghost. Either way, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. When we pray, how many times have you heard about people praying selfish prayers? It's in the casino all the time, just walking through. I've told the story many times, people asking for blessings when they're playing the machines. The little old lady I saw blessing the machine right before she hit the button. The thing is, is that most of the time when people pray or when they think about prayer, it's selfish. It's not led by the Holy Ghost. Because the thing is, the Holy Ghost is never going to lead you to selfishness. Never. So when you pray under the leadership, empowerment of the Holy Ghost, you'll be praying for others. You'll be praying for change in their hearts, in their lives. The third thing we are told is to keep yourselves in God's love. As you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Now, to some who read that, it sounds like Jude's saying, you guys are on the hook. You're not, you're not going to just sit back and relax. You have to do the work, too, to keep yourself in God's love. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to work for our salvation. Let me be clear. Once saved, always saved. We're not working for our salvation. But when we're doing God's work, we're in His will. And when we're in his will, we're in his love. So we have to do this. And how long does he say we have to do this? Not for a month, not for a couple weeks. He says that we have to do this till the Lord Jesus Christ brings us to eternal life. So until we pass from this world to the next, we are to always be working towards being in God's will. We are always to be working towards keeping ourselves in God's love. We have an example of what Jude means. 
And it's always great when the Bible explains itself. And you don't have to interpret things. I love that. You see, when Jesus said in John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. It can't get any clearer than that. If we work to keep, and I call it work because most people find it very difficult to follow the commandments that we've been given in the Bible. And, and believe me, there's more than ten. Some people just pick those ten and they hold on to those ten and they say, as long as I stick to these, I'm okay. There's a lot more than ten commandments. But what Jesus is saying is if we follow those commandments, we abide in his love. There is no other way to do it. We can't just throw money at it. We must follow the commandments given to us. Now, Jude encourages his readers, the believers, to show mercy to those who have doubts. Now, this is important. There's a difference between those who are openly against the word of God. They're openly against the will of God in their lives. These pastors that preach prosperity, name it and claim it. God wants you to live your best life. Now, these men are not preaching the gospel. They're openly against the gospel because they're preaching against what God's word says. That is why, as, as one very famous pastor puts it, those pastors are the clouds without water. But the thing is, is that there are some who are sitting in the pews, they're sitting in the chairs next to you, and they're influenced by possibly other pastors that they've heard preach. They're, they've got it in their head over years of what they've been living with that this is how it has to be. They even go as far as to say, well, I don't believe God wants me to do that. Even though it says the Bible that God said to do this. Well, I don't believe God wants me to do that. These are the people who are confused. They have doubts. They doubt the Lord. And when this happens, you have to take into consideration those doubts might have been sown by false teachers or false believers. So what you have to do, what Jude encourages us to do, is we're to show mercy to them. In James, it says, For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Again, there's that reference to the sea. We, we get that a lot throughout the Bible. It's mercy that we show, and this is the important thing, with those people who have doubts, those that may be confused. They may be on the fence. They may say, I don't know what I believe. That's when it's important for us to act because it's the mercy that we show that could give them direction in their lives. It's that mercy that points to the Lord. That is the mercy that we need to be showing to them. Now again, some people want to say, well, how do you figure that out? How do you tell who's, who's just, who's confused and doubting and who's just openly against the will of God? There's, we've read Jude, we know he's outlined it very well. The main idea Jude presents here is that mercy and caring and compassion, instead of judgment and anger, possible rejection, is what can help a doubter believe. In verse 23, Jude urges his reader to snatch out of the fire unbelievers who are perilously close to entering eternal punishment. So again, we're not just supposed to sit back on the sidelines and say, well, let the next Christian witness to them. We're supposed to actively try to save as many as possible. Which means that if you have family members who are doubters, if you have family members who are not saved, you want to see them go to heaven. So why aren't you acting? That would be my question. It seems as though I'm trying to trivialize it or make it easy. I know it's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy conversation to have. I know I've tried to have those conversations. 
But again, we must go back to the fact that we show mercy and compassion and caring. And I would even put in diligence, following up with them. We are to show the doubters and the unsaved what it is that they're missing in their lives, which is their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The the thing that we need to remember, and this is where I want to caution everyone, our compassion needs to be tempered. It needs to come with sensible caution. And I say this because it's admirable that we want to reach somebody who is corrupt, somebody who is living in sin openly. They may even be enjoying living in sin. And it's admirable that we want to do this. We want to help them. But it's unacceptable to be drawn into their immorality. In other words, trying to reach and help sinners is great, but we must be mindful not to be pulled into their sin. A good illustration of this, I was talking to a gentleman who went through AA. Not exactly the full Bible-based teaching that I'm aware of, but the thing is, is that he said one of the gentlemen he was in AA with happened to be a deacon of a church. And this deacon said one time, you know, the best way to describe the idea of helping others without being sucked in is you would never send a recovering alcoholic to a bar to witness to drunks. That is what we need to be watchful for because when we are predisposed, just like an alcoholic would be predisposed to relapsing into alcoholism, if he were to be in the middle of a bar. We need to be able to identify where our weaknesses are, where we could be sucked back in to whatever sin it was that Jesus pulled us out of. So we need to have that temperance. We have to have that mindfulness when we go into the situation. Now, I would also say that I would never send, not a slight towards any women, I'm not calling you weaker sex, anything like that, but I would never send two women to witness in a bad area of town without an escort. Just wouldn't do it. Brother Tino and I, when we go out and we do our distribution, we go to the homeless camp, I would never feel comfortable sending two women to do what we do, only because of the fact that there are more people out there that needed help than just the two of us. I was confident that we could handle the situation, whatever that may have been. I couldn't be that confident if it were two women. Again, I'm not bad-mouthing women. I'm just saying you use common sense when you are doing things. Finally, Jude ends his letter with a benediction. And in that closing, he gives us three abilities of God. Now, this is where the encouragement comes in. He gives us three abilities of God. And let's face it, God is able to do anything. All things are possible through God. But in this situation that he's addressing, he gives us three abilities of God to help us through this. First... God is able to keep you from stumbling. Jude's been writing of the dangers of false men, false teachers, false believers, coming in quietly to God's people and trying to lead them astray. But God is powerful enough to save us from being tripped up by the stumbling blocks. And he's able to lift us up when we do stumble and place us on solid ground. God can do that for us. The second thing he says is God is able because he has the power to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. To give glory to God and not ourselves for being made presentable to God. He's the one that did that for us. 
You see, God realized that there was no sacrifice that was ever going to be presented that would be enough. So he sent that sacrifice. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son as that sacrifice for us. The prospect of being kept and presented faultless in heaven should be an encouragement to all of us. And it should be enough to give us the energy, I guess you could say, to run the race set before us and to keep looking to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's facts that are immutable. These facts are that we cannot forgive our own sins. We cannot grant ourselves eternal life. Only God is able to do that. Through His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we have been given the opportunity to have an eternity with our Lord. Now, third and lastly, he says, God is able to bless you with great joy. He says, exceeding joy. That means that when the Lord comes, not only will we be free from worldly struggles, from these pains that we feel now, but we will rejoice with joy far beyond anything that we've ever felt in this world. The thing is, Jude didn't point something out, but I want to point something out in all three of these examples that he gives, God's abilities. We cannot ever limit God. We should never try to limit God. But again, we must do some of the work. And in order for us to receive these abilities that God is able to use for us, there's some things that we have to do. We have to remain faithful and trust in the Lord with all our hearts and all our minds. And we must do, like Jesus said, obey His commands. Are we going to fail from time to time? Yes, we are going to fail. Absolutely. A couple weeks back, I called everyone here sinners. That tag is true. Does that mean that because we're saved, we're no longer sinners? No, we are still sinners. But the greatness comes from God that we are forgiven for those sins. So we must be faithful to the Lord and we must obey his commands. And Psalm 56.4 should be a rally cry for Christians. Psalm 56.4 says, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will fear not what the flesh can do unto me. There is nothing in this world that can present any kind of fear as long as I have our Lord and Savior with us. Jude concludes his letter with praise to God. He describes God as the only God, our Savior. He does this because that is a fact. There is only one God, and he saves us all from our sins. And when I say us all, I'm talking about believers, those of us who have put our trust in Lord and accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So we've gotten good news from Jude. It may have taken us two Sundays to get there. But along with that good news... We can take away what to look out for. These stumbling blocks that may be placed in our lives that we have no idea. I refer to Bertha Better Than You, which is from a song. But that's a fact that there are going to be people that present themselves as very pious, very, Lord, I am the best Christian because I'm here every Sunday. I tithe more than everybody else. I even know everything that the pastor said the last three weeks. But yet inside, they don't believe any of it. And it's when those people plant those seeds of doubt. That's when we are supposed to be mindful. That's when we are supposed to use what Jude has given us to discern who it is that we trust 
I thank God for the ability to stand before you and bring his word. And I thank each and every one of you for coming to hear his word. I'm going to ask Brother Bill to come up as we have a moment of silence and reflection where we can pray. And as we do, may we pray in the Spirit, guided by the Holy Ghost. Pray for those who are not yet saved. Pray for our enemies. Thank you, Lord, for this day and this message. Let us keep it in our heart, Lord, that if we're filled with the Spirit, we have your life, and we can keep sin at bay. It's our choice afterwards. Thank you for coming and saving us, Lord. We just thank you that we still have the time to come and worship and hear your word. Be with us now, Lord, as we go forth into our times that you keep us safe and you bring us all back next week. And just be with, with those who are online listening, Lord. May somebody understand and accept your word from what they've heard. In Jesus' name, amen.